Hi everyone, I'm Barry Mitchell, and welcome to an all new edition of Simply Science. Well, I'm finally out of my house and taking a stroll here in beautiful Central Park. You know, Central Park is one of the top tourist attractions in the world, and recently some huge tourists were visiting our waters. It was a guy from Jersey who was skinny dipping in Bethesda Fountain. Our Andrew Falzone also found some other aquatic tourists. It was almost as if our new friend was waving hello. It was a massive pectoral flipper that was off in the distance, moving up and slapping down on the water. It belonged to a fairly small humpback whale that looked to be about 15 feet long at the most, making it one of the younger whales we'd see. And this peck slapping behavior is exciting for whale watchers, but it's not the holy grail for naturalist Celia Ackerman, who's having fun educating guests, but also doing research for Gotham Whale. We're actually looking to try to identify the individual whales that we see uh, by photographing the underside of the fluke image if we can. A fluke is a whale tail and it helps with research. That pattern there that's distinctive, like a fingerprint for each whale. After noticing more and more whales on ferry voyages, Captain Tom Palladino decided to change gears. First year we went out and we did about 50% sightings. And all right, let's try it again. And then it was 60. Up until the last three years, I would say there's 95% sightings on each trip. And it's incredible. Tom spent his whole life on the water and knows exactly why so many large ocean creatures have suddenly appeared. The water had just gotten better and better. The clarity is eons better than it was in the 50s and 60s. And the New York City Department of Environmental Protection confirms this, telling CUNY TV the water around New York City is the cleanest it's been since record keeping began during the Civil War, and that clean water is attracting what whales love. And there's a lot more Manhattan and bunkers than there ever was before, and they feed on them. Manhattan and Bunker are the same fish. Up to about a pound in weight and 15 inches long, they can be seen in schools of thousands off the south shore of Long Island. Incredible Instagram accounts like Fish Guy Photos and South Fork Salt have captured drone images of predators feasting on the Manhattan. The largest of the patrons prowling for Manhattan are the humpbacks. Occasionally we do see a few more of the older adults, but uh, predominantly the juveniles, the smaller size whales. Um, averaging 30, 35 feet at birth, 12 to 15 feet, and they can double in length in their first year. What might surprise you most about whale watching is that you don't have to go too far to find them, about a 20 to 30 minute boat ride, and you're ready to watch. After departing from Sheepshead Bay in Brooklyn, we saw the humpbacks just off the coast of the Atlantic Highlands of New Jersey. The whales we saw traveled all the way from the Caribbean, where they spend the winter mating and calving. And when they're down there in the winter months, they're not eating, they're fasting for several months. And come spring, they head north. Gotham Whale and American Princess want to protect the whales they watch, which is why they follow guidelines from WhaleSense, a joint project between wildlife charity, whale and dolphin conservation, and NOAA Fisheries. So we try to stay on the side of the whales. We don't get in front of them, because uh, that's where you'll bother them. And letting the whales do their thing is all they have to do to delight their audience. That is one of my favorite part of the jobs, to see the joy from the people who are seeing a whale for the very first time. I'm Andrew Falzone for Simply Science. Now for some of the city's smallest residents. Our Ari Goldberg spoke with a scientist who's discovering thousands of new microscopic species who ride the subway with us every day. We wanted to study a place where we know there's a lot of exchange of microbes between people. And this is the place with the greatest density, the most traffic, the most people all smooshed into one place. So we thought this is actually probably the best place to study this question of microbes and how they move in a city. That place of microbe exchange in question is the subway. 
Since 2013, Dr. Christopher Mason has been studying bacteria and viruses around the world, specifically its subways. While he's based in NYC, the research encompasses 60 cities across six continents and 32 countries, and over 900 volunteers. And they just released results from a major study. So I don't know how to, how to frame this question scientifically, but how much stuff did you find in the subway? What we found in our study is that there is a wealth of new biology, basically new species, new microbes that we found that are just uh, under our fingertips. This includes over 11,000 new viruses, almost 1,000 new bacteria and new, new types of microbes. And then also we found uh, thousands of known bacteria that we already knew about that, that we could then quantify and see where they are around the world. For comparison, according to Dr. Mason, if you take a soil sample, you can expect to find, say, only hundreds of new types of bacteria. So to find over 10,000 was a surprise that there's such a vast, little-known biology shared among us. Almost seems like a silly question to ask, I guess, but what's the point? Why are we studying you know, microbes in the subway? The exciting thing about these bacteria is we can learn from how they are resisting viruses and other bacteria and use them as medicines. Antibiotics are usually discovered when someone's looking at how a microbe defends itself against another microbe. Now, before anyone gets nervous about germs, the study is not saying it's dangerous to ride the subway. Despite the words bacteria and viruses, the vast majority of these don't even interact with humans. They're mostly in competition with each other, fighting for survival among themselves. And studying that can benefit humanity. If we see something that looks like a, a tool and a trick that a microbe is using to survive, we now know exactly what the genetic fragment is, and we can then try and basically grow that up. We can basically say, okay, this is what's letting you survive. Uh, maybe it can help us defend against the bacteria that also is going after you and keep us safe and make it so we don't die of a bacterial infection in a hospital. Despite the potential medical implications, the impetus for the study was just as much out of simple curiosity. My curiosity for this subject came from the fact that I ride the subway to lab every day, the second reason is my daughter once licked a subway pole and I wanted to know what happened there. Uh, and, and the third reason is, you know, we had been doing more and more experiments where we could see there's always little bits of DNA that are shared between people. And it's the surface that's shared arguably the most between people. Mason and his team plan to continue to gather data annually, a global microbial census, if you will, to help track the rise of pathogens around the world or changes in a city's microbiome, much like you track a city's water quality or air quality. I was surprised at how uh, how universal this curiosity, I think, really is. It's like, well, we all are riding and you'll grab a railing and sometimes it's weirdly warm or, you know, you know peculiarly moist. And you're like, why is it like that? And you know, we all these, I think, private moments of mystery and public transit. But this, uh, so I think it, it builds on that curiosity as a human, as, a, as just a strap hanger. But I think scientifically, it also says, well, there's exchange here, there's biology here. I want to know what it is and can we learn from it? And so I think if, as, if you're a scientist, you just want to say, well, we should study that. For Simply Science, I'm Ari Goldberg. The COVID-19 vaccine uses a breakthrough technology called messenger RNA. What else can doctors do with messenger RNA? Here's Mike Gilliam. Millions of Americans are living safer lives after being vaccinated for COVID-19. The success of the mRNA vaccines has given researchers hope that the groundbreaking work might be a positive takeaway from the pandemic that offers huge potential. Certainly there were a lot of challenges and problems and issues, but there are also positive things that can come out of the pandemic because it can reveal some of the things that we need to address in, in uh, society and science and all those different types of things. And one, one of the, those things has been the need for better ways to develop vaccines. The magic of the mRNA technology or platform is that you can take a piece of whatever you're aiming to attack, like the spikes in the coronavirus molecule or a tumor or bacteria, and introduce it to a molecule and then inject that. And it will tell the body, hey, this is not supposed to be here. And the body triggers its immune system to attack it. The applications are potentially endless. You could really take any type of pathogen and do that. And you could do it in a very quick time. A, a short time period. And that's really, you know, the, the whole world of possibilities that's opened up by this mRNA platform. Scientists are looking into whether the mRNA platform 
which had been in development for about a decade, could be used to tackle a number of health issues, ranging from HIV to Parkinson's disease to cancer. One thing researchers have been trying to do is to develop immunotherapy, meaning trying to get your body to recognize cancer cells and use your immune system to get rid of them. If you can find key proteins or key differences on those cancer cells that you can then take the mRNA and say, okay, this is the blueprint for this protein that's on this cancer cell, and then get your cells to produce that specific protein and then stimulate your immune system to help fight the cancer cells. There's definitely that potential. So the key is, can you find those special proteins that are on cancer cells that your immune system can target? We're not just talking theory here. It looks like this has worked in the case of Molly Cassidy, a mother from Arizona. Molly was diagnosed with neck and head cancer and nothing was working for her. She'd been told she didn't have long to live and to get her affairs in order. But her doctor, Julie Bauman, asked if she wanted to take part in a clinical trial. They injected her with mRNA and she's doing much better now. Her scans show she's cancer free. I'm sure uh, companies and, um, and of course academic laboratories that work in, in uh, uh, proliferative disease are, are, are making great efforts to do this. Pharmaceutical companies are in some cases teaming up to work on the research. In a statement, Regeneron told us they use their trademark VelociSuite technologies to create therapeutic intervention. We have used these technologies to develop life transforming medicines across therapeutic areas. We have also used VelociSuite to develop our 30 investigational medicines that are currently in clinical trials for a wide range of diseases. While scientists aren't willing to say that mRNA technology will offer us a cure for cancer or some of these other diseases in the immediate future, they do say the technology offers a lot of promise. Platforms and methods, but first we have to understand the mechanism of the illness itself before we can treat it. In the meantime, the work continues in the battle to wipe out cancer using knowledge gained from creating the COVID vaccines. But if you're in a situation where you can get a lot more targeted therapy, targeted therapy is, is one of the keys for cancer in the future, that's really the holy grail. I'm Mike Gilliam for Simply Science. And here's another medical breakthrough, a wearable cane for visually impaired children. It lets them run free and play. Here's Donna Hanover. Running exuberantly is a typical and joyful aspect of childhood. That's challenging for children who are visually impaired or blind, but a new mobility device is helping some of them dash about without fear. It was developed by Dr. Grace Ambrose Zakin the CEO of Safe Toddles and a coordinator for rehabilitation teaching at Hunter College. The pediatric bell cane is a white cane that little toddlers who are blind can wear. She says many of them were previously fearful of collisions. They will be walking, just like anybody, happy to go, and then suddenly run into a wall or fall off of a stair or trip over something. They were afraid. Some had been given straight or rectangular canes they need to hold or improvised devices like push toys, laundry baskets, and wooden chairs to help prevent mishaps. But the wearable cane is different and many parents are delighted. He walked so much faster, there was no kicking, he was confident, he just walked right along and that made me, it really just makes my heart full. The design is simple, but actually kind of ingenious. It has a belt that has an inside that won't chafe, and it closes with an industrial strength Velcro. Two-year-old Kennedy's mother, Andrea, actually made a video to show other parents how it goes together. There's two magnetic pieces right here that actually clip into the belt. Clip, 
and this magnet moves completely freely. This is on rollers. So as she walks, it's got little wheels, works great. This is completely hands-free. This moves and pivots with her. She can pick it up. It will drop as she goes downstairs, all that stuff. She can hold onto the bar if she wants to, but she does not have to. She walks around just like this. Grace and her team have helped many kids learn to use the belt cane, and their research shows it can help blind children improve social and language skills along with movement abilities. They're now working on a smart belt with an app that counts the number of steps kids take while wearing it. The original pediatric belt cane was developed about five years ago in Grace's garage. We worked with uh, Professor Bixen in the City College of Engineering. He's had tremendous impact on the design, making it so usable and friendly. He invented the he magnets. He invented the magnets <laughs> and, um, and so many other things. The pediatric belt cane is modeled on the classic white cane that has been in use since the 1930s and 40s. It has the red of the tip, the white of the shaft, and the black of the grip. So it, 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 it mirrors what a white cane looks like. That was intentional. We had explored the idea of fun colors, but it isn't a toy, and we don't want the idea that other children come over and ask to have a turn. Does this in any way kind of stop a child from moving on to using a single cane? Actually, it eases the transition. They learn, I really appreciate having this feedback and uh, pushback about what's in front of me and what to do with it. So then as they get to be four and five, they are cognitively and their language is aware enough to want to be a big boy or a big girl and do the big boy, big girl cane. More than 1,200 pediatric belt canes have been sent to families in almost all the states and many countries for much less than their cost or sometimes even free thanks to generous donors. So more and more visually impaired and blind kids are using pediatric belt canes to go full steam ahead. It's like they've been let loose. <laughs> it's pretty amazing to see them take off. It's almost like they've been shot out of a can and then set free. I'm Donna Hanover for Simply Science. Consider the plight of the poor scientist. You do important work. People expect you to be serious. So what happens when you show your fun side? You can be accused of not taking your work seriously. Well, molecular biologist and educator Raven Baxter found the perfect formula. We some big old, big old, big old geeks. I'm a chocolate girl, skin Reese's Pieces. I run this thing like electrophoresis. You mess with me, your knowledge increases. I began writing songs and performing science music. Turns out that people actually really like it. I thought it was very silly at first, and you know, people probably wouldn't take me seriously because, you know, the stereotype of a scientist is somebody who's very serious. Meet Raven Baxter, a.k.a. Raven the Science Maven. Fortune magazine took her seriously enough to name this molecular biologist educator one of its 40 under 40 most influential people. You build yourself as a science communicator. What does that mean? Someone who makes science fun, engaging, and accessible for the everyday person to understand and enjoy and participate in. I do a lot of things from my standpoint as a woman, but I really seek to inspire and engage everyone, not just women, but I, being that women are underrepresented in some STEM fields, it is really important for me to emphasize um, my presence there as well. STEM, of course, is the acronym for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, disciplines Raven hopes to inspire young people to pursue. It also inspired Smarty Pants, Baxter's own science-themed apparel company, with a portion of the profits going to STEM education. This rhinestone bling shirt is perfect for the budding scientist, with sizes for everybody. Let's talk about your uh, corporate career. You were a molecular biologist. As a corporate scientist, I was doing cancer research. I was identifying different drugs to treat different diseases, and it was really fun. I learned so much. Not fun, the racism she encountered in the corporate world. 
I did experience some direct discrimination, racial discrimination, and, you know, it wasn't just me imagining things, like people would really just come out of the blue and tell me, like, you don't belong here, and you're a token, and, um, you know, but based on my, my racial identity, and it's, it was really alarming, because I'd never been treated that way before. Varying shades of skin colors are all a reflection of the different amounts of the types of melanin that are produced in our bodies. It really just struck me as a culture shock and something that we need to look at and, and change. And now it's Dr. Raven, the science maven. In May, Baxter received her PhD in science education from the University of Buffalo Graduate School of Education. Next. I've just accepted a position at UC Irvine in California, and I will be directing in their School of Biological Sciences. And I'll also be teaching as well. I had somebody reach out to me recently who was just expressing how happy it made them and how confident it made them to see me have success. But what they appreciated the most was that I did it as myself. For me, some of my greatest successes in my life have come from me failing. It's because I was able to fine tune everything that I was doing to do better and ultimately get to where I am today. What I always tell people when I mentor them when they're starting their science journeys is to be your unapologetic self and don't negotiate your identity and come as you are and you will have success. NASA, SpaceX, Blue Origin, Virgin Galactic. Seems everyone's talking about space travel nowadays. And a new book called 30 Second Space Travel makes the whole thing sound easy. So easy that even a billionaire can understand. Here's our Elizabeth Kovitz. 30 Second Space Travel was essentially the idea that we put in the subtitle, key ideas, inventions, and destinations that have inspired humanity toward the heavens. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. We wanted to give everyone a comprehensive sense of what it was like from the very beginnings of the science and technology of space travel to today and the future when we actually are living in space as human beings. And. This book on the major scientific principles of space travel is a really fun read. The idea is to take these things that might initially seem complicated, it's literally rocket science sometimes, and to make it into something that's enjoyable. It's short uh, snippets of information. You can read it cover to cover if that's what you want to, uh, but you can really just spend a small amount of time uh, with the book and expect to learn something about one of the topics. And you couldn't ask for a more interesting group of 30 second tour guides to the history and future of space travel. Karen and I are both astrophysics professors and we study the universe itself and how we've gone to explore it. Alan's expertise is actually a really neat bookend to both of ours, where Alan knows both about the history and all the cool old tech of space travel and rockets and so forth, and also the frontier things, the solar sails or all the latest kind of science fiction ideas that are being brought to reality by modern research. So this team is really an amalgam of a broad spectrum of knowledge and understanding of the whole concept of space travel. So let's talk about some of the ideas in the book. It seems that humanity began accumulating the principles behind modern spaceflight a very long time ago. And the first chapter, appropriately, is about the first rockets. So just how long have we humans been sending rockets to the stars? So the very first rockets that people launched were in the Song Dynasty in medieval China. And they were both for military purposes, like missiles, and for civilian purposes, like fireworks. Um, and so people have been dreaming about space travel for a long time, but it really became possible in the reality in the 50s and 60s. Almost the last chapter in the book is all about the brand new non-chemical rockets we're developing now. In 30 seconds or less, can you guys tell me about ion engines and solar sails? Ion engines basically take a very heavy molecule like xenon or something, accelerate it to very high speeds and shoot it out the back of your rocket. It's very gentle acceleration, but in space, over time, you can build up a tremendous amount of speed and a tremendous amount of motion with very little weight. And, turns out, 
Solar sails are more than just a cool sci-fi idea that looks good on Star Trek. The cool thing is that even light has momentum. And so uh, photons of light bouncing off a mirror impart just a tiny, tiny impulse on the spacecraft. It, it's so tiny, um, you would never even notice it uh, on the Earth. Um, but in space, in the vacuum of space, and over really long periods of time, it's enough that it can accelerate spacecraft. Well, so between between puttering and speed of light, where where are we in this? <laughs> you, you would very much start puttering, um, but then if you did it for, or if you could figure out a way to do it for years or decades, you could get very, very, very fast. For practical as well as hopeful reasons, do you think space travel draws all Earthlings together? Yes, absolutely. My few seconds worth on this is just think about Apollo Soyuz. During the Cold War, what brought America and the Soviet Union together? It was a handshake in space. The book is called 30 Second Space Travel, and it is so much fun. Fun book written by fun people. I'm sure you'll all enjoy it. This has been Lisa Beth Kovitz for Simply Science. And that's our show from lovely Central Park, where you never hear helicopters or sirens. Hope you enjoyed it. Remember, you can always reach us at tv.cuny.edu and Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. I'm Barry Mitchell. See you next time on Simply Science. Ba -ba -da -dum -dum -dum. Da -ba -da -da -dum